I will give uh, Pak Pati Basri uh, to response uh, very briefly before I open a question and answer uh, session. Pak Pati Basri, please. Thank you very much, uh, Kiki. Uh, Ibu Mary, the way you ask the question, it's really like you're my teacher because, because your <laughs> questions really help me to, to, to put this, this paper into a better shape. It's also a comment by, by Reza. So your, all your points are well taken, so let me address some issue which is probably uh, important to be shared for the lesson learned about uh, the policy. Because Ibu Mary asking about, uh, especially about the political economy. So let me let me share the political economy story with this. <coughs> I didn't, I did not write um, the, this issue uh, in, in a sort of like in quite deep in this paper. Yeah, because I thought I was thinking to focus only on the, on the policy response, but maybe I have to need to, to, to include the political economy story. Uh, your question, uh, your comment regarding the importance of policy coordination. Yes, it is very important. And this is related to your question as well about this bad times makes good policy. The reality is far from, you know, not easy as what we thought about the process. Because uh, at a time, uh, both government and the central bank, at least the MOF and also the central bank, we agree that the first one is we need to decide what is our, our policy objective. And we decided at that time is stability over growth. Yeah, we decided the stability over growth. It means that the government will support the uh, more uh, tight uh, economic policy both on the fiscal and also on the monetary side in order to stabilize the economic growth. That's the, the most important. We had several meetings between the MOF and the central bank, and we decided that we have to put stability over growth. The next question is how to communicate this to the politician? Because this is very tough. It happened only nine months before the election. Yeah, and and I think this is this happened already about four years ago. So probably it's about time for me to to share the story with all of you. The process was not easy, not easy at all. Yeah, but the thing uh, that we did at that time, we tried to convince the politician, the leaders, uh, all the people at the time, that if we do not take this stern action, the economic situation will continue to deteriorate. And my last punch slide at the time, it is true that nine months after this we will have an election, but I'm worried if we don't, if we do nothing, we won't have an election next year because we will be in crisis. Yeah. So this really put the bad times makes good policy. The second one is how to convince. This is exactly your question, uh, Ma Mary. How to convince the leader to accept the weak currency? Because for many leaders, maybe. It, uh, including the current administration, believe that the strong currency is politically good. It reflects that the confidence is there. But actually what happened in 2013 was the overvaluation of the rupiah. The rupiah was, was you know, too strong. It is exactly explained by Reza in his, in his chart about the monetary policy, you know, the, the divergence between monetary policy, the expectation and monetary policy. Uh, so at that time, uh, Bumari, what we did, we sort of like we provide a trajectory path. Our argument at that time was the quantitative easing period is an abnormal world. The normal world is the world pre the QE. And look at the rupiah pre the QE, it was around 12,000. So what happened after the QE, the rupiah appreciated to around 8,000, almost 9,000. So what we need to do is to bring back the exchange rate back to the normal situation with this pre-QE. Yeah? In order to do that, we have to let the exchange rate to the pre-share. Fortunately, we have you, <laughs> and we have Pak Budiono as a strong anchor to understand about this macroeconomic policy, get a strong support of this. Yeah? And then the second one is to convince the leader at that time to support Bank Indonesia for raising the interest rate. Yeah, because raising the interest rate means slowing down the growth. 
which is, of course, as a leader, uh, every leader in the world doesn't want to see their economy grow is slowing down nine months before the election. Yeah, but we said that we need to do this kind of policy. We need to support the Bank Indonesia, but Bank Indonesia is relatively is not relatively is independent actually. So what we could do is actually to give a strong support to Bank Indonesia that they don't need to worry about the government support. So at that time, what uh, I did, I called Pak Agus and I said that let me worry about the government side. You just do it your monetary policy side. Let me try to convince leader. And we had a two and a half hour meeting with the president at the time until Pak SBA eventually agreed. And he said that I leave it to you and immediately I called Pak Agus and I said the government will back any policy made by the central bank. And a few days after that, the Bank Indonesia start to raise the interest rate 50 basis point, 50 basis point, 50 basis point. But the government need to do their homework to, to ensure that stability over growth is uh, uh, very important. The other thing, uh, Bumeri, is about communication. This is very difficult because we have to distinguish the way we communicate with uh, public to the market, to journalists. What we did at the time, every two other weeks after the Friday prayer, I made a small class at the MOF which is the participant are journalists. So I explained to them, like, like what I did in the class, the saving investment gap, that's what, why we need to do this kind of thing to sort of really love basic principles about this Eco 101, about the policy. And I said that if this happened, this should be expected because uh, slowing down of the economy is by design. You don't need to worry about it. To the market, we conduct conference call almost every two weeks. And we said that you would expect this would happen. Yeah, to the policymaker, we continue to sort of like to work with this. And that's explained, this is the thing that I like from this story. Not many people realize that 2013, the rupiah was depreciated by almost 20%. But not much panic at the time. In fact, in 2015, when you said Reza, the rupiah was only depreciated by less than 10% but creates a panic at a time. So the issue of this communication, it shows that a very important issue. You have to manage you know, your, your, your stakeholders, you need to talk to the market, you have to convince your bondholders, you need to use your, your uh, uh, network, even that, uh, let me tell you a secret. Uh, I asked Nuril Rubini to write an op-ed about Indonesia, you know, the positive side, the specific story about Indonesia at a time. Because, yeah, because because if this this uh, message come from the government, nobody will leave us. They should ask someone else to. And of course, Nuril is a doctor do. You know, he always keep a very pessimistic uh, view. But in Indonesia, he was very optimistic at the time. So we 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 ask his his support as well. Um, about this global policy, I don't have the answer for this, Ibu Mary. But uh, I think based on our experience. It is important to have at least, there are two uh, possibilities of this international coordination. The hardcore one, we do the concerted effort together, fiscal and monetary, it is in my view, it's not possible. The second one is the soft core. We exchange a policy during the G20. So in my view, G20 is probably the good forum to exchange view, to share its other experience. The implication is, after Benanki, I think Janet Yellen improve the communication yeah they, they have a better communication now yeah what yellen did in the g20 meeting she gave a presentation he gave a sort of like trajectory the possibility you know 70 percent of the member of the uh, reserve bank saying that there is a need to adjust the interest rate 15 percent so he she just gave this probability which is really give us a sort of like an insight what kind of policy that we need to anticipate i think the way uh, Yellen communicates is much better than Bernanke. And even if you recall, when uh, China devalued their currency, uh, the Fed decided not to raise the interest rate at the time to consider China. It is the opposite what um, uh, Bernanke, uh, Bernanke did. Uh, let me respond to Reza's question. Just one question. I think uh, I, I completely agree with your comments. But your question about this fiscal space. 
whether we should abandon this 3%. I, uh, I would say that I would agree with you if you can ensure that this government could be uh, immune for the political intervention. In the sense that once you abandon this 3%, that everyone will come to you to ask for a more fiscal or government uh, program, whereas every program always can be justified. In my view, with, by putting the 3%, this will push the government to, be, to become more efficient. Because even until today, a lot of issues related to the quality of spending. Yeah? Even the government is not able to absorb the 3%, basically. So, so from my perspective, probably it's better for us to maintain the 3% rather than giving too much room for the politician to abuse the fiscal deficit. Yeah. So I think... Just one. Okay, sure. The, the, the issue is uh, maybe not <coughs> abandoning the 3% then, but make it into a cycle of five years instead of on an annual basis that we have to have that 3%. So maybe this year you can have a 3.5% deficit as long as tomorrow we have 25 this is about three percent. So looking at the full cycle of five years of the government sort of annual basis. Thank you, Dr. Rajar. Thank you, uh, Pati Basri, for uh, response to the questions. Now I open a uh, question and answer sessions. Uh, uh, to my watch, we have around uh, 25 minutes. I open, I, I think I may open uh, three uh, questions. One, Dr. Fabrio. Another two. Left hand side, right hand side, please. Okay, Dr. Pedro, please ask a question. And please mention your name, yes. uh, affiliation. Uh, my name is Fabio Casaribu. I'm head of research for macro and trade uh, at LPM. So Kiki, basically my boss. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you very much. This is a very um, a special moment, special occasion for us. Um, I learned a lot from uh, all of these distinguished speakers. I enjoyed. Uh, you were our professors, our uh, our lecturers when we were still students. Me and Kiki, we actually just one one year apart, so uh, we were really your students, and we learned a lot from you guys uh, uh, continually, even till today. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, my question is, um, uh, I think about. Um, uh, when, when we talk about monetary policy, we talk about m transmission of mechanism, right? Now, my question is going to be the reverse of that. So, we are always afraid of um, uh, hot money coming into our uh, financial system, right? Now, um, and, and always there is a dichotomy in our thought, at least the way we speak about it, between uh, short-term capital inflows uh, with foreign direct investment, as if uh, that these, these, the sources of these two monies, type of monies, will be different type of investors. Well, I think we might be mistaken on that, because what happens is, when hot money coming in, they usually um, uh, respond to incentives, clearly, but the incentives will be coming from, clearly, from the financial market first. And as for money coming into Indonesia, they will go to government bonds first here, or to stock market. That's why we have 40% of our government bonds now owned by foreigners, and now we have 60% of stocks now owned by uh, foreigners. Which is not too bad, comparatively, uh, in terms of if we think about it as uh, market confidence towards our economy. But the problem is, we always fear that to be um, uh, something that's gonna be hazard. Uh, as soon as there is a uh, global financial crisis, or uh, at least there is a shock in the global financial market, we're going to be uh, uh, thinking about how to uh, curb uh, the impact to our economy, right? Now, I think what, 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 what the problem is, uh, just uh, Paris also mentioned just now, was um, our market is too shallow, and we don't have enough uh, channels uh, for this money coming in uh, to be transmission into real sector, right? So this, this is what I mean by reverse transmission mechanism. So we, first of all, we need to learn how quickly they come uh, uh, in terms of hot money. And not only that, we need to learn how quickly they become uh, to, to, to convert to become 
uh, deposits in the commercial banks, right? And there will be transmission how uh, the, the yield in government bonds will actually uh, follow on by uh, lowering uh, uh, loan uh, rate. Um, from the data, we can see that that from 2000, uh, during the tape tantrum, before the tape tantrum, we had uh, billions of US dollars coming into our market. And then not long after that, it was followed by increase in foreign direct investment. At least we can see that from the bank loan to increase by about 30% per year, uh, or around 20% per year, and then slowing down to now, we have a very pro-cyclical uh, 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 growth of loan uh, with the uh, GDP growth rate, right? So my question is, do we understand, how much do we understand really uh, the, the reverse of transmission of mechanism from the financial sector back to the real sector? How, how, fast, how, how, how fast is it, right? Now, maybe also we need uh, to, to, to provide more of channels of, uh, in between real sector and financial sector. Uh, I, was, I was thinking about the tax amnesty program that we just finished. And we had about a hundred trillion, several trillion, hundred trillion US, uh, rupiah coming in. But we know, I mean, based on several uh, version, of course. But there are actually hundreds of billions of US dollars money parked in uh, Singapore, the closest to us, actually owned by Indonesia. So when we talk about foreign direct investment, of course, we're not talking about nationality here. We are actually talking about simply about nationality of the money, right? We invite them to come. So when we talk about that tax amnesty program, several uh, people have been uh, analyzing this and we say, oh, maybe if we had more of uh, types of investment. Dr. Fabry, um, can you make it shorter? Oh, excuse me, yes. If, if we could have, for example, uh, 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 in the context of uh, infrastructure projects as well, um, I, I'm, I, I remember I, I've been bothering Bang Dede with these questions in the last several months about the infrastructure bonds, etc. Maybe we could have channeled those money much better and to make the market uh, not as shallow. So something like that. So we, we're not going to be so afraid of a uh, global financial shock and we will be trying to uh, you know, do something just to avoid that. Why, why don't we try to uh, take advantage of that capital inflow with uh, getting our market more ready? Uh, but, uh, excuse me for taking that time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pebrio. You know, uh, lectures. Figures, <laughs> pictures, and all diagrams in mind, and then they need to be delivered. Okay, uh, I can open an, another two questions, uh, but uh, please be uh, straightforward and please mention your name and affiliation before you pass a question. Uh, any other two questions? Okay, one from this side. Okay, please. Thank you. Thank you, Fadede. Uh, Pareza for a very interesting uh, session. Um, I have a couple of questions just linking to the fiscal story one. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm sharing the view that I think there's a need for looking at a fiscal more in the medium term rather than sort of like annual. And we see that also in terms of the, the issue of how government spend the money. I mean, the current administration really improved. I mean, we just you know, looking at the last quarter, and the spending is actually improved in terms of, you know, reducing subsidy, look further, and, and so on and so on. But we still have the challenge of how to, to, to plan in the medium term, because if you look at the short term, you know, you kind of like have the, the, the issues of, you know, uh, whether your spending is actually effective, whether you're actually managing your risk in the medium term, and things like that. So I think, I hope we can continue this discussion to actually make things uh, concrete uh, on the ground to actually improve the, the, the things in the medium term. My second uh, uh, is a question on this, this uh, financial sector issue. Like, everybody knows that we need to deepen this financial sector, and the challenge is always uh, how would you do that? Uh, I mean, there's uh, several uh, thinking uh, or, or ideas uh, around that, but I, I would like to bring also a, 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 a uh, a comment that we see from the again the government role in, in financing the, 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 the gap is somehow it's crowding out the private sector sort of like uh, 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 and that's again the initiative to actually get in the financial uh, uh, sector so are you in that uh, sort of like same view and if you think that's the case how do the, the current administration need to, to uh, improve that thank you Thank you. Uh, I can open one plus given the time. Any? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Budi Rusa Sudarmo. And you, uh, 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 Hati Basri, you have been 
mentioning uh, that India and Indonesia can um, come up with uh, from the temper tantrum, but uh, why India come up much better than Indonesia? Uh, could you uh, give some description of why that happened? Thank you. Thank you very much, Prabodhi. So, uh, Pak Basu, you have, I think, around seven minutes to respond to all the questions. Fabrio, I I completely agree about the framework first that you should channel this capital inflow into the real sector. Yeah, because as you know, if this money stay in the in the, in the financial sector without the government or the private sector are not able to channel it to uh, the real sector, it might create a bubble. But the difficult part is uh, how to make it happen. Yeah. And this is related to uh, their last question as well. Um, I agree that one of the key issues related to the issue of infrastructure, because you mentioned specifically about infrastructure, is about financing. But to me, this is a secondary issue. Because the most difficult part is on the implementation on the ground. The first issue is, uh, related to the land clearing. Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunately I'm, I'm involved on the on the company uh, related to the infrastructure now. We and the company we are looking for project, but not many good project available. Many people come by saying that we have this infrastructure project, but not a good one in the sense that. You know, it's not uh, commercially viable. Uh, the regulation is still not complete yet. So basically, it's not really a good project. Only a few projects available related to that. And that's explained why it is very difficult to channel from the financial sector into the real sector. Uh, let me give an example about this land clearing. One particular power plant project, it took us more than 10 years to get this land clearing to happen, yeah? So I think without doing something related to the uh, issue of this land clearing, we, lucky we already have this eminent domain law has been passed about three years ago and fully enacted now, so I would expect a better situation. But still a big problem, even if you're talking about this MRT. Yeah, the second phase will face a challenge related to the issue of the land clearing. Yeah, so money, to me is secondary because once the opportunity is there, a lot of people will come to invest especially on the infrastructure uh, sectors. So I completely agree with you, but the question is uh, how we make sure um, that the opportunity is there, especially on infrastructure projects. Most of the infrastructure projects now focus only on uh, two sectors, road and power plant. Uh, do you know the reason why? Because on those two sectors, the government regulation already completed but not in other sectors. That's the question from Febrio. Uh, on Dela, uh, your, your, your comments is, is very similar to Reza's comment. My concern related to this is, uh, to, the, to your question is like this. Yeah. If you larger the fiscal deficit, yeah, if you larger the fiscal deficit, let's go beyond 3%. Even if you're talking about medium, Maybe, you know, if, he, if not by year, probably about the, the medium term. We have to look at this issue uh, carefully. But let's say if you larger the fiscal deficit, you probably need to look at the loan to deposit ratio now. Our loan to deposit ratio is about 90%. If the loan grow faster than the deposit, the LDR will go probably about 100% will make banking sector become vulnerable. So it means that the capacity of banking sector to expand will be as fast as the growth of the third party fund. So if you larger the fiscal deficit, then you will withdraw the money yeah, from the banking sector into the government bonds. This will tighten the liquidity and your concern about this cutting out, which is actually happening now. The reason why we have this a very shallow um, a bond market is because the liquidity issue. That is why we need the foreign investor, the foreign holders, on the on the bond market, so I think uh, I'm not talking about the number. We really need to look at this 
whether we need to expand the fiscal deficit as much as what we want, but we need to be very careful with the growling up. That's the first one. The second one is about effectiveness. I hate to say this, but I think the subsidy is back now. <coughs> because with the oil prices about $55, last year about 40 by now the government should adjust the fuel price by at least 15 to 20%. The government decided not to raise the price for electricity 450. So probably we have a subsidy about 50 trillion nowadays. The subsidy is back. If you're looking from this perspective, a lot of room actually to improve rather than increase the budget deficit. Yeah, and the quality of spending. If you want to have a, a significant impact on the growth, just spend the money on the area which have the marginal propensity to consume is very high, which is the poor people. But my concern, not to criticize the government, if you provide the non-cash support for the raskin, the cheap rice, then the question is whether this cheap rice will be available in every outlet all over Indonesia. If not, you spend your money, but basically no consumption. Because with the non tunai, we have to go to every warung, and every warung has to have this cut leader. So we have to make sure that Bullock can supply this. Without that, you look at the Dana Desa. We spend about 60 trillion, 70 trillion money, what will be the impact? Yeah, so again, you know, I'm, I think I'm still in the, in the position to look at probably do the some efficiency on the government spending rather than to increase the, the, the threshold for the budget. Um, Budi, your uh, question, uh, I, 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 I explain a little bit, but basically the first reason is because the terms of trade effect, because India benefited from the uh, declining commodity prices. The second one, uh, it, because India benefited from this declining commodity prices, their current account deficit also improved much faster than us. So give much room for the Reserve Bank of India to lower the interest rate, which is push the economic growth uh, much faster. The third reason is because the reform in India, I think in terms of opening up the foreign investment, this is related to uh, Mary's question, is much more significant than that. Uh, we did try at that time, uh, Mary, especially to revise the, uh, the negative list, but I would say the, the result was very nominal. Yeah. Uh, we didn't do much our homework related to the opening up the foreign uh, investment. India did a significant reform, especially on the banking sector. You open up, they let the foreign ownership on the banking sector, on the services sector. That's what retail, retail, yeah, and retail, yeah, and that's really helped the, the economy to improve. And most of the foreign direct investment in India went into services export, which is does not have, which is naturally has. In our case, most of the foreign direct investment went to the natural resources and domestic market. We did good in the short term, but later on, when they pay the uh, profit repatriation, there is a risk of the mis uh, currency mismatch. So the lesson learned is maybe in the future, even foreign direct investment, if possible, focus on the export-oriented sector, because this will be naturally heads. Yeah, if this foreign direct investment focus on domestic market, on natural resources, there's always a risk on the capital account side on the balance of payment. So I hope I answer all these questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patibasri. Uh, I commit to myself to not conclude this uh, discussion, <laughs> seminar. So uh, before I return back the power to the MC, uh, please join me to give a big round of applause to Dr. Patibasri.